module six. All right, module six is on uh, distributed control panels um, or dis distributed control systems. Uh, and DCSs are, are used somewhat like a, a PLC system, but it's more, uh, PLC is usually for like one specific uh, process or piece of equipment or something like that, a dis uh, dis distributed control system. Is like for the whole plant. Um, you would use this throughout the whole plant and have everything kind of connected together and you can tell when, when stuff's going out of calibration. There's just a lot more that goes along with this. Um, I have never messed with or seen anybody that uses a, a distributed control system um, where I've worked. So um, I don't have a lot of experience with them, but I know that they're similar to PLCs. Um, but I feel like a lot more industry is going towards PLCs and distributed control systems. I think this book is about uh, seven years old, so it's not super old, but it's, uh, I think that the DCSs are getting more and more out of date, but we still have to go through the chapter. Um, my first highlight is the trade term protocol. That is an online test question. Like you'll only, you'll only see that online. A set of rules for communication between two devices using a common protocol enables devices to communicate even if they're made by different manufacturers. This would be like Ethernet. Stuff communicates over Ethernet, no matter what brand it is. Um, you should know what some of the other stuff is. Um, drop, fiber optic network. Um, you should know what a server is. Um, they're going to talk about SCADA. A little bit, I think I have a highlight about that. Um, TCP and I, TCP IP um, is just the, um, that's just the communication protocol. Um, in 110, dis distributed control, um, on the right hand side of page one, I've got the second and third sentence highlighted um, as my first highlight in the text. Unlike many historical and present day control systems, DCS does not rely on control from a single centralized location. Instead, there are many different control points from which they're located close to elements they're managing. So that would just be like a desktop computer um, on different different lines that you can go log into. Whereas a PLC, PLCs kind of work the same way. Like in most, most industries, like you can log into PLCs from different places, um, but the main ones, you're not logging in remotely. The main ones are on that specific line or whatever control room you're in. A PLC is is more um, localized. The next, the immediate next sentence is a separate highlight. The concept behind DCS is that control is spread out in layers that have a hierarchical relationship to each other. Key in on that hierarchical relationship to each other, um, and we'll talk about kind of what that means. Uh, so what what I mean by hierarchical, like the the all the way at the bottom we have our inputs and our outputs, right? Where we have our processes all the way at the bottom. So this would be like all of our detectors, ultrasonic level detectors differential pressure meters, stuff like that. This is all our hardware right here. Um, above that, we have our inputs, outputs. So that's going to the different controllers and stuff. So you have your controller software, controller historian is all kind of on the same level. And then you have your um, operator console. So that's what your operators are gonna use inside your plants. And then your engineering workstation, that's where you can like go in and change code and stuff like that. But there's, there's a, um, 
there's a hierarchy in all of this. Like it starts from the bottom and works its way up. Um, yeah. Um, I don't have it highlighted, but it does say the um, in a DCS overview, there are five major components, sensors and actuators, controllers, field bus network, networks, building networks, servers, workstations, and operator workstations. And that's kind of just the different uh, levels of, of the architecture of the DCS. Page two. Page two, I've got the first sentence on page two highlighted. Uh, field bus network networks link sensors, actuators, and controllers together by using a simple cabling system and common communications protocol. So that's just that's just the way stuff is connected together to communicate with each other. Next paragraph, last sentence is highlighted. A connection to the network is known as a drop. This is another trade term that they have. But just a connection to the network is known as a drop. So anything, anything that's connected right here through the I.O., that would be like a drop to a specific component. One, two, zero. Um, just like the operator workstation they got on the top of the picture. So this would be like the, um, where operators can work stuff. And then usually back behind this, at least for PLCs and stuff like that, is where the engineering workstation is. Um, and that way they can get in and do the code with the operators in the room and whatnot. But they've got different HMIs and um, control screens and stuff like that. So this would be at the top of, close to the top of the hierarchy. Um, from the architecture of the DCS. Um, 120, um, distributed control system evolution. Um, on page three, that first full paragraph on page three, um, the first and second sentences are highlighted. When the microprocessor was developed in the 1970s, engineer, engineers began to experiment with Using digital control and localized parts of industrial processes, these early digital controllers were connected to simple networks by simple networks to larger computer systems that process data and provided basic user interfaces to the process. The first full paragraph on page three, the one that starts with when the, when the microprocessor, um, the first two sentences of that program or of that paragraph are highlighted. Um, next paragraph, first sentence is highlighted. By the late 1990s, most distributed control system manufacturers were tapping into mature, mature commercial IT infrastructure as the basis uh, for most of their technology. Up above, up above that, I wrote improved networks. So they're using other IT infrastructure to improve their networks. Uh, immediate next sentence is highlighted. Microsoft operating systems and other software products provided the majority of the server and workstation functionality, displacing earlier operating systems and databases. That's where Mark, Microsoft made a lot of their money was getting into stuff like that, um, getting into industries and stuff like that, and, and, and being the first ones to do it. They made, I mean, that's how Bill Gates became a billionaire. I mean, not only the home PC, but also getting into factories and stuff. 
What's that? I said that simple. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't. I still, computer's been around for a while, but I have no idea how they get this screen to show up on a monitor. Ones and zeros. That's insane to me. Uh, how do they send that through? Like basically a reflection. Huh? Wouldn't it be like a reflection? Not really. It's ones and it's it's like the like the gate logic stuff that we talked about. It's mm -hmm. all this is just ones and zeros. I don't know if I can still do the no. But like the, the it's code for for all this stuff. I don't know. It's in like it's still crazy to me that they got this stuff to work. Um one three zero distributed control systems versus other systems. Um, second paragraph, the last paragraph on page three, first sentence is highlighted. At one time, the difference between the three technologies was much more different than it is now. And that's talking about, if you look in the um, paragraph above, they're talking about, I think it's SCADA, DLCs, and DCSs. Yeah, DCS, PLCs, and SCADA um, are the three different technologies that they're talking about. Um, essentially what they did um, is they started out separately and then they all kind of, um, they didn't combine, but they all kind of turned into somewhat the same thing, but different. Uh, more so DCSs and, and PLCs. And I think SCADA is pretty old. Um, 131 DCS versus PLC, page four. Um, one, two, third paragraph. Um, I've got the sentence, a couple sentences right towards the end highlighted, right after where you see figure three in parentheses. Uh, PLCs can also be can also be standalone technologies associated with just one machine. Um, it's not connected to anything else. By its very definition, a DCS is not standalone. So when we talking about like those little micro PLCs with a few inputs and outputs, um, like those can be a standalone unit, a distributed control system is for like everything. You're not, is the internet not going on on that one? No, it died. Okay. On eight, that's not gonna last. Like go ahead and go get another one. Anybody else is about that? I'm going to give you just a minute for that, and I'm going to send you an email right quick. But I, like I came in and it, like half of them were unplugged and it shit pisses me off. Like it took me forever to get those laptops. I don't know. Did that go to the teachers? Yeah. It wasn't plugged in. No, it was plugged in, but it was like this. Oh, yeah. I, that's, I came in and plugged in probably seven or eight laptops. We need to be plugged during the day. 
Um, usually it was me, but they like they pull those carts out and go to other classes with them. Like they have, there's several teachers that use those during the day. Dog and seat, like this is this would be for uh, a DCS, and you can kind of see how the how it's kind of the same. Like it's a rack mounted. This kind of looks like a PLC, and they have like this is the um, I'm sure this is the um, power supply processor, um, and then they have different cards for stuff. This looks like a uh, this looks like a um, digital input, digital output. So it looks like outputs, but I can't tell what, what type it is. But it's they're so similar, but they're different. Um, All right, uh, 132 DCS versus SCADA. Um, the second sentence through the end of the paragraph is highlighted. Instead, SCADA systems uh, collected data from sensors using centralized computers that organized, logged, and displayed it. This was data acquisition aspect of the system that collected data often got pushed up to large corporate IT systems that used it to prepare reports designed to help facilities um, facilitate executive level decisions. State, pretty much what you need to know about SCADA was it was just dat data acquisition. Like they weren't controlling stuff with SCADA, they were just pulling in numbers. So like, um, like how fast the the factory was producing stuff and stuff like that like they could pull in numbers like that um, to see like how efficient they were and then they could make decisions on on stuff based on like executive level decisions based on that so whenever you think of scale think of data acquisition um, next paragraph in the top right of page four the second sentence to the end of the paragraph is highlighted scada didn't emphasize automatic control. Instead, instead, it provided convenient human machine interfaces for humans to use in making control decisions and adjustments based on the data it supplied. So again, they just, it just provided data and then the operators or um, other people made decisions based on that. It wasn't, it wasn't automatic. The 133 safety instrumented systems. Um, this is another one that I haven't seen, but I think this would be, uh, this is for like um, um, hazardous locations or probably like nuclear power plants and stuff. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a thing in its own. This is kind of a weird highlight. I've got the, the you need to know what SIS stands for. So I highlight or underline that the first four words of the paragraph, a safety instrumented system, SIS, and then highlighted the second paragraph to go along with it. In many industrial processes, a control system failure could result in a bad product or a loss of revenue, but the results wouldn't actually be dangerous. However, there are some industrial processes known as critical processes that have almost no margin for failure. A malfunctioning control system can result in explosion, fire, dangerous chemical reaction, or contaminant failure. For processes of this type, an extra layer of safety is necessary. The SIS meets this need. So it's just, it's a control system separate for all like the, 
or hazardous locations or safety stuff um, separate. You got four questions on page five. You can knock those out right quick. I get the highlights one and two. From pages one and two. Um, page one, I have protocol and the trade terms highlighted as an online test question. And uh, 110, distributed control. I have the second and third sentences highlighted. Unlike many historical and present day control systems, DCS does not rely on control from a single centralized location. Instead, there are many different control points, with most of them being located close to the elements that they are managing. The immediate next sentence is a separate highlight. Uh, the concept is behind DCS is that the control is spread out in layers that have a hierarchical relationship to each other. Page two. First sentence on page two is highlighted field bus networks link sensors, actuators, and controllers together using simple ca cabling systems and common communication protocol. And second paragraph, last sentence, um, a connection to the network is known as a drop. That's it. No five mils. Number one, modern DCS provides control over a large process through the use of B, lots of connected components. Two, sensors, actuators, controllers communicate using field bus. The three, the 1970s era invention that made modern DCS possible, microprocessor. And four, which technology emphasizes data collection in this play with the purpose of helping humans make controlled decisions. SCADA. Uh, up here on the board, um, which one of these would represent a distri distributed control system? There's one word I want to try to key in on. Let me see. Bottom. Bottom. So whenever you see hierarchy, think of distributed control system. Which one's uh, PLC? What's that? Top one. Top one. Commonly found in machine control. Whenever you think of PLC, you think about like machine control. Um, SCADA. Data, data collection is what I want you to key in on. And then anytime you see, see safety or emergency or something like that, that's the safety instrumented system. 
Good. Section two. Components of a DCS system. Um, in the trade terms, I've got field device highlighted. Field device, a general term for a sensor or actuator that interacts directly with the process. Field devices are at the bottom of the DCS hierarchy. So this is all the way at the bottom. You got your sensors, actuators, stuff like that. That is known as your field devices. I also have partitioning highlighted on the right hand side. Partitioning is dividing process I.O. across multiple drops or multiple I.O. I.O. cards in order to prevent a failure from causing a process shutdown. If you think of partitioning, just think of separating stuff. Um, going on into the chapter, page seven. Um, Talking about the hardware, like I said, a lot of this stuff is, is somewhat similar to um, PLC controllers and stuff. 211 talks about field devices. Like I said, a field device is going to be sensors, uh, the moderate temperature, pressure level, and flow. So anything that me uh, measures that. Uh, 212 controllers, uh, the top right of page seven. Uh, I have that sentence highlighted up there. Another similarity to PLCs is that the I.O. is mapped to the processor, which needs to know what type of I.O. card resides in each location. Up above that, I wrote I.O. The I.O. card is located in the controller. And that is an online test question. Make sure you get that one. Another similarity to PLCs is that the I.O. is mapped to the processor, which needs to know what type of I.O. card resides in each location. The I.O. card, and then up above, I.O. card is located in the controller. So what that means, like, like I've talked about, like PLCs and DCSs are rack mounted. And then you have different different cards in here. Um, and you have your power supply, and then your processor, so or your CPU, and then and then you have your I/O, like your your other card. So and be your I/O. Um, what it means by mat um, means that like if this if this one is a um, specialized controller. Um, the CPU has to know that that is in rack, like they don't count the power rack. So rack number three um, is where the special, what, what type of, for a PLC at least, what type of uh, uh, spe, or a specialized card, what would that monitor? I don't remember. Or like the slot, like what, what would go into a, not even that. That's a communication card. USB. Yeah. Now, what type of device? <clears throat> Thermocouples. Thermocouples and RTDs have their have their own types of cards. Then you can have like you can have like uh, um, di discrete I/O, which is just on off stuff like that. You can have an analog card, but all those like whenever you program this stuff like you have to map it to the CPU so it knows on the back on the back plane of this or like the tabs that all this stuff plugs into it has to know which slot it's talking to information from so that's all it's saying is the IO cards are located in the um, controller page eight and nine Um, 214 controller applications. Uh, second paragraph 
Um, I've got the sentence with the real time highlighted along with the sentence after it. So all the way at the end of page eight. More significantly, controller operating systems are almost always real time. This means that they can respond to events such as changes in I.O. values rapidly in predictable amount of time. Two two zero. Uh, servers and workstations. In two two one, the function of a server. I've got the first sentence highlighted. So all the way at the end of page nine. First sentence: Servers, as their name implies, provide services of some type. Services of some type to other devices or clients on the network. Uh, up above, up above services, I wrote, provide services and critical resources. Page 11. Page 11, the second paragraph on page 11, I've got the first three sentences highlighted. In the second paragraph, servers often have larger and faster hard drives, particularly if they are used as file servers, file servers and other types of servers that must maintain data integrity typically contain RAID arrays. A RAID array is a group of hard drives that keeps multiple copies of the same data along with error correcting information. I'm not going to go into some of this stuff too much. One, because I'm not, I haven't ever messed with it too, because I don't really don't even know it. Um, software server 222. First sentence of 222 is highlighted in a DCS, the main job of the software server is to control and store system software files. It holds the master database plant graphic files. <clears throat> Page 12. Two two four other servers on page 12, second paragraph, first sentence is highlighted. The job of the historian is to track data, data values of process points and write these to a hard drive so that they can be retrieved later for analyzing trends. That is in two two four, second paragraph, first sentence. The job of the historian is to track the data values of process points and write these to a hard drive so that they can be retrieved later for analyzing trends. Two two six. Um, we're going to talk about the different types of workstations. Um, two two six. The the sentence that's right above um, the bullet points is highlighted. Uh, the applications most frequently involved are listed here um, and I have all the bullet points highlighted. Um, a program to build and modify operator workstation graphics, program to build and modify control logic, software to configure and maintain drops in, in the system, an IO builder, a program to load controllers with uh, control logic, various diagnostic tools. And then I need, like, I need you to kind of add a bullet point. Maintenance and programming are done at the engineering workstation. So that that all goes for one highlight. So add maintenance and programming for a separate highlight, but a separate bullet point. Also add loading programs onto new controllers. That is done at the engineering workstations. Loading programs onto new controllers is done at the engineering workstation.
So adding maintenance and programming, and then adding loading programs onto new controllers. Two, three, zero. And I guess it goes to the next one. Field devices act, interact with the process, include sensors and actuators, controllers, monitoring, control process by interacting with field devices. Servers provide services such as software, database, and security. Workstations allow en engineers and operators to interact with the DCS. 230 DCS communications. The Fourth sentence, fourth and fifth sentence in 230 at the bottom right of page 13 are highlighted. A typical DCS hierarchy has at least two levels of networks, keying on two levels of networks. One is fairly low level, which is the field bus, while the other is usually much more powerful and sophisticated, which is the corporate building network. So DCS consists of two levels, one being the field bus and one being the corporate building network. 15, basic networking 231. Um, they have the OSI models, which is like the TCP IP protocol model for what's um, for, for networking and stuff in between different types of communications. Um, that's what's up here on the board. So it starts out at the physical layer, which are going to be your like your cables and stuff like that, and then move its way up. Um, the highlight that I have on page 15 is in the third paragraph, first sentence. All networks have this is what called this all networks have what is commonly called a physical layer, which is layer one in the OSI model. Page 16, we're going to talk about different types um, of connecting stuff together. So field bus is the way like stuff is connected together. Um, you can also have Modbus or Probibus. Any of y'all mess with any of that stuff yet? Most stuff is going to Ethernet. Um, Probibus is pretty common. A lot of people like Probibus for the different types of drops, um, but most stuff anymore is, is going to um, industrialize Ethernet. Um, so page 16, I don't have anything in Modbus, but Probibus 234. Uh, second paragraph first, two sentences are highlighted in Profibus. One advantage to Profibus is that it has self-diagnostic capabilities. The physical layer specifications for PA, for the PA version also include cabling system that can be used in an explosive environments, a definite advantage in some industries. The immediate next sentence is an online test question. Propibus is prevalent in Europe and is supported by DCS vendors such as Siemens and Yokogawa. Siemens is big. I don't think I've heard of Yokogawa. Probably gigantic. But Propibus is prevalent in Europe. Online test question. Page 18. Ethernet networks 237. On the right hand side of page 18, second paragraph or middle paragraph on the right hand side, first three sentences are highlighted. T typical Ethernet network includes a number of devices that manage network traffic. At the bottom of the network are the network switches. In figure 15, every device on the network has a cable that runs to a switch, which is usually located in a wiring closet or rack room. All a switch does is a switch can take in like several different um, like components and then they send like they take one of the usually it's the first um, 
drop and they send that to like that's what would go to like the server or something like that so this so they would have all these devices connected to the switch then the switch goes back to the server um, page 19 first sentence on the page page 19 is highlighted a firewall is a device uh, designed to protect parts of a network from unauthorized access becoming more and more prevalent especially I tell you all about like LSU and Southern University got locked down because someone cyber hacked the schools, like held them, held them under ransom and stuff. Like they told students and teachers not to even come to work because they couldn't do anything. So it's becoming a bigger and bigger thing to put up firewalls. And I heard, I heard it's not even people in this country. It's, no, no, it's people in other countries. They don't know where these people are. They, I mean, I'm technically I'm a state employee. You can't, you wouldn't believe how much training they make us take to not open up an email from an outside person like they think everything is like a phishing email that's all i teach uh industrial ethernet so that's where i was saying most people are going to uh, 238 the bottom of page 19 all the way in the bottom left i've got the first sentence of that second paragraph highlighted industrial ethernet has the same basic specifications as ordinary Ethernet and is compatible with standard devices and wiring systems. This page? This is page 19. Bottom, bottom left to page 19. I don't have it highlighted, but the, di like the difference is, is good to know, which is in the top right. The difference is that industrial versions of these components are housed in protective enclosures, have heavy-duty connectors, and better shielding. Heavy duty connectors and better shielding is the main difference between industrial Ethernet and regular Ethernet. Human machine interfaces, HMIs, 240, moving on to page 20. Right before the bullet points, I've got that sentence before the bullet points on page 20 highlighted. The human machine interface or HMI of BCS is usually called the operator workstation. Operator workstations can include the following components. Not all workstations have all these features. Then I have the first bullet point highlighted. Process graphics called diagrams to monitor the process. So that could have something like, like looking up here on the board. Um, this looks like some kind of boiler unit or burner unit or something like that. But you can make, you can create these these, at least in PLC season HMIs, these graphics aren't that hard to create. Um, but um, and then like all these numbers, like these are different columns inside of this thing. So these are probably be some type of thermocouples. Um, and like I talked about, like each one of these is is a device, so a sensor, a sensor. So this would be the all the way at the bottom of your of your hierarchy um, but even like I said before each one of these pieces of IO has to be mapped all the way back to the, the processor so they could go to a switch that would go back to the processor um, it's, it just depends on, on what they are um, 242 bottom right of page 20 process graphics first sentence is highlighted process graphic figure 18 depicts the process equipment and the flow of control Uh, two, four, three, analog. They're going to have analog and um, digital control. So analog would be something that varies. So see these these bars up here, like unit load, airflow, fuel flow. All these are a percentage. These would be analog inputs that are put into this, and then the graphic, like this is at ninety-two percent. So it's almost all the way. This one's I can't tell what that is, but these things move. It's, and same thing down here, these things move up and down um, like analog. But if I look over here, like I have a fan A, B, fan A, B, I don't know what these are, but these would be digital. Digital means what? Numbers. Huh? Numbers. Discrete. Discrete. What's another, what, what does that mean? Uh, 
What do you think of when you think of discrete? Ones and zeros. What does one stand for? On. Zero stands for off. So these can these can only be on on and off. So these would be digital or discrete. This is analog. It can be from anything from zero to percent to hundred percent. This thing, these analog varies. Discrete is just on and off. I don't have any highlights in two four three or two four four talking about analog or discrete, but you know, should be getting that stuff. Um, the alarming system two four six analog indicators. Street indicators, analog controls, uh, 246 alarm screens. Um, usually you have like whenever you have like your process screen like right here, um, you like whenever I build these screens, I usually put a little button right here and it has like an alarm screen and, and it turns back and forth between red and whatever color it is to tell you if it has alarm. You can click on that and it would take you to a screen like this and you can see you can see the alarms. And, um, 246, last paragraph on page 23, first two sentences are highlighted. Traditional hardware alarm systems provide provided levels of alarm severity using sounds and visual flashing. Colored lenses and bulbs are also used. A DCS can replicate this functionality and add many more alarm levels called priorities using colors and sounds. So Probably a lot of people have seen those. A lot of times in factories, they'll have different colored lights. Like they have like it's red, yellow, green um, lights for if stuff's wrong or if they're running out of material or something like that. Same thing. You can have you can build that into this. You can have high priority stuffs coming up um, or stuffs stuffs in the good stuff like that. You can color coordinate um, that stuff. Um, I do not have anything on pages 24 and 25. See if you can knock out those five questions on page 26 real quick.
section. Yeah, we're doing pretty well as far as uh, the book work stuff because we haven't even made it to midterms and we got two tests left. But we're just spending, like I told you all along, the higher up in these classes you go, the more time in lab that we're spent. Y'all got those? It's most of them. Number one, uh, DCS controllers generally require an operating system that's Hey, real time. So it's got to be something that, that's happening in real time. Two, DCS maintenance and programming is usually done on a page 13. <clears throat> The engineering workstation. So maintenance and programming is done on the engineering workstation. So that's B. Number three, which field bus includes specifications for working in an explosive environment? Profi bus, D. Four, cables from Ethernet devices like computers and controllers connect to a switch, A. Five, communicate information about process components most operator workstations use. That's graphics. Good. So 1C, 2B, 3D, 4A, 5C. All right, one more section. Um, maintaining a distri distributed control system. 310, um, the importance of maintenance. I have the second to last sentence in that first paragraph in the top right highlighted. Therefore, efforts aimed at failure repair and component replacement take priority over routine maintenance and calibration activities. And then down below that, I wrote minim minimizing process downtime. Kind of wrote minimizing process downtime is more important or greater than uh, preventative maintenance. So a lot of, like whenever you get in the factories and stuff like that, they'll have what, what are called PMs, which are preventative maintenance, um, which is usually whenever stuff is down, you go do certain things so that you don't have a catastrophic failure or have some type of failure in the equipment whenever it's running. Um, so like that, and that should help minimize process downtime, but you're never going to shut down a line to do preventative maintenance, right? Like that stuff that has to be done whenever, if, if you have to do it with a line shut down, you're not going to shut down a line to do preventive maintenance. Um, 311, preventive maintenance scheduling. First sentence is highlighted. Production downtime can be minimized by servicing uh, instruments according to a scheduled maintenance program. Any of y'all hold you? Do y'all do, do PMs? I don't do PMs. You won't get on, hired on full time, like that's probably when you'll start doing PMs and stuff like that. Um, and some of them, some of these like process guys get kind of not process. A lot of times it's process guys. Like they had they had me doing dumb stuff. Like we would pull out computers and take the covers off and blow them out and stuff like that. Like some of them are kind of dumb like that. But like a mechanical preventive maintenance would be like greasing motor bearings and stuff like that so that they don't fail. Um, but there's there's just different stuff that you can do to go make sure 
stuff is is not going to fail in the next however long, whenever whenever the line shut down. The last sentence in that paragraph is also highlighted. However, it is generally acknowledged that regularly serviced equipment will fail less often and provide more accurate control of the process. More often you service stuff, um, the more accurate it's going to be and the less often it's going to fail. I will say the more you shut stuff down and when you bring it back up, that's when you have the most problems. Like stuff, like machinery, a lot of machinery wants to just keep on running. When you shut it off, that's when you have issues and stuff. Um, probably like I'd say 80% of the call, like major calls that I had whenever I was a process electrician were from whenever we were starting stuff up. Um, that's whenever, that's when other stuff would have issues. Uh, next sentence is highlighted. A scheduled maintenance program is typically planned around the following elements. And then I highlighted the third bullet point. History files, maintenance department, uh, instrument history files provide valuable information about the types of instruments used, their failure frequency, and the reasons they failed. If you work somewhere, somewhere that doesn't have some type of log book for like each piece of equipment, like um, like we had a log books and each individualized piece of equipment had a section like a drop down menu you selected that if you had to work on it and then whatever you did to it you would write what the problem was and what the solution was and um that was super helpful for like if, if the problem happened again i could go into that system and for the last 10 years everybody that's worked on that piece of equipment um, posted what happened and you can find like a solution super fast rather than you sit there trying to try to figure out what to do or where to go stuff like that logbook was is super helpful like if you work for a company that doesn't have that push for it uh, or definitely keep your own um, page 28 313 um, maintenance so this is an online test question. So bottom left of page 28, uh, online test questions. Second and third sentence. Ideally, maintenance should be carried out in the instrument shop. Instruments are brought to the shop for routine maintenance based upon the manufacturer's recommendations for maintenance intervals, manufacturer's service bulletins, or failure mode analysis reports from the maintenance department. So ideally, you take stuff in and you bench calibrate it, and then you go put it back into service. And that way, you're not working on working out in a greasy environment, something like that, and get something, um, some type of containment into the process. Um, you can bring that stuff back to the shop, bench test it, and then bring it back. 320, calibration and repair. That whole paragraph is highlighted up at the top right of page 28. If instruments are not kept calibrated, control of production quality will uh, degrade and some products will have to be discarded. Therefore, regular instrument calibration typically scheduled uh, either on site or at the instrument shop. Typically, operators um, will check calibration at the beginning of shifts um, on different, like especially if you're using scales or something like that. Um, when I was at the steel mill, we used we sold those big coils of steel. They're sold by weight, not necessarily length. Um, so the the guy all the way at the end of the process, all the way at the end of the gal line before it went to shipping. Um, every shift he had like a coil when the plant started, it was like a test coil and they, they know the exact weight of it. So he would pick it up, put it on scales. If he was too far off, he would call us to calibrate the scale. And that way, whenever we were weighing stuff and putting it out the door, whatever we were charging the customer was an accurate representation for the weight that we were charging them for. So we weren't, we weren't overcharging or we weren't undercharging for the amount of steel we were selling. So it has to be calibrated. Uh, three, two, one calibration. Second paragraph, last sentence is highlighted. All calibrations must be tra uh, traceable to national standards body, such as the National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST. I think y'all had that highlight before in a previous book. But everything has to be traced back the original thing. Repair 322, second paragraph, second sentence. Before performing work on site, you must first consult with the operator in charge of the area in which you will be working. 
always, always, always go talk to an operator before working in their in their section. Um, that's where that's where you'll get the most complaints about you if you don't. Like if you just go start working on stuff and jack around with somewhere somebody's stuff where they're working, like they're going to complain to your boss, and that's where you'll get complaints. Plus, these guys, some of these guys like doing the same thing for 15 years in a row, and they know how their piece of equipment works. They probably know what's wrong with it. It's probably happened to them a hundred times. It might be brand new for y'all. Go talk to your operators. Um, most of the time, like I worked in a huge plant. Like I didn't know how everything exactly worked. Like I would have to go to them and be like, how is this thing supposed to work? And what's it doing now? Um, like that was my conversation pretty much every time something happened. Like, how is this supposed to work? How's it working now? And then go start my troubleshooting there. But I would never just go to the line and go to the control room and try to start tracing stuff out. Go talk to your operators first because they might they might already know what's what's wrong with it. Um, troubleshooting a distributed control system, page 29323. That sentence that's right before the bullet points is highlighted. Troubleshooting a DCS is relatively straightforward because DCS maintenance work. Orders almost always result from one of three causes. Uh, first bullet point, a field device failure. Second bullet point, failure of an IO module or a point on the module. Third bullet point, uh, failure of wiring or network communications. Bad letters. Yeah, somebody does something wrong. Um, out to the side of that, right, not software fault. Um, not a software fault. Mo most of the time, huh? Said fault. Fault. Yeah, no, not a software fault. So most of the time, like the software is not going to fail. Like whatever you put into the computer, the computer is going to do. Um, it's not going to be a software fault. It's most likely going to be some type of hardware failure. Page 30. 327 control controller failures. Page 30, 327, controller failures. First paragraph, last sentence. A sign, a sign of a memory fault is a controller that is still online but with no program running. A sign of a memory fault is a controller that is still online but with no program running. Network failures, 328. Second paragraph, first two sentences. Problems on a corporate network can be extremely complex um, depending on the network design. In many cases, you have to work with the IT department that is overall in charge of the network. In my, in my experience, everywhere I've worked, they have a separate IT network. Like I would never go in, um, like the picture that's on page 31, I would never go in and mess around with that stuff. I would call IT and have them fix it. I was never responsible for going and messing with the switches and servers and stuff. I left that to IT or process control. Uh, 330, acquiring expertise. Um, 331, equipment knowledge, all the way in the top right of page 31. That whole first paragraph is highlighted. In order to repair any instrument, you must have an in-depth knowledge of how it works. In other words, you must know its theory of operation. A superficial knowledge of the equipment will not be sufficient. The next paragraph, last sentence before the bullet points is highlighted. The following sources should be used to obtain product specific knowledge. And I have the first bullet point highlighted manufacturers service training programs. The best trainings I went to were usually the free ones like, um, like we had big giant 40 ton cranes um, where the where the variable frequency drives would go bad every so often. Um, they had free trainings up in Milwaukee. So my our company just had to get us to Milwaukee and put us up for the nights. And that was the best, like that training was awesome. It was free. Like if you're buying their stuff, they want companies want to train you. That big old that big five axis mill that's out there, the big Haas mill. They gave 13 of those away to community colleges because they want people to learn how to use them so that people buy those for factories and stuff. Um, most, most companies offer 
training. A lot of them are free trainings. And that was plus like you get to go different places. I got to go all over the country um, doing different trainings and you go to training during the day and you can go out at night and stuff and see. And we went to the Harley Museum in Milwaukee and did this stuff. But, uh, I don't know. Trainings are, and then and also you get paid to go. So anytime you get to, you can ask to go on training, go on training. Do you? Yeah. Yeah, I think I had 75 bucks a day to spend on food. Something like that. Yeah. Um, at the bottom of those bullet points, um, kind of write in another bullet point. Uh, do not take apart working components without proper knowledge. If you're trying to learn about equipment, find one that's broke that you're going to throw away and take it apart. Do not take apart working equipment. Page 32, talking about DCS security. Attacks from without. Weird way of saying that. 342. Um, third. Third sentence through where you see blacklist is the first highlight. There are a variety of strategies that are used to protect the network. Firewalls are a major line of defense. A firewall prevents certain protocols from crossing from one side to the other. It can also permit or deny specific network addresses from crossing by consulting a whitelist and a back blacklist. Like that's just whitelist is what you can be let in. Blacklist is obviously one you can't, that it doesn't let in. Then the last sentence of that paragraph is a separate highlight. A firewall only works properly if it's configured correctly, correctly. So setting one up is a task for IT professionals. The next paragraph, first two sentences are highlighted. Encryption is another way to prevent, uh, prevent security problems. Encrypted data looks like gibberish, so it helps to thwart or Spying and eavesdropping. I think that means weed out. Um, attacks from within, 343. The second and third sentences are highlighted in 343. One way that malicious users can gain access or disrupt a system is through malware. These are programs that gain access through apparently in Innocent means such as an email or through a website visit. Out to the side of that, I wrote contact with outside computer systems. Contact with outside computer systems. So is that like if I was to take my work email and put it on my phone and my phone gets tied? Would that be would that be within? Mm. Like I'm trying to figure out without with, I get without, like I get without other people. Like within. I mean, yes. Like if you if your stuff got ha like, it's something that you're downloading. Like they used to do it with all the free games and stuff like that. Like talk people into downloading like a free game, and they download it. It would give you the game, but it also put something in the background that's going to hack your stuff from from the inside rather than trying to get you to click on something outside. So it's it's downloading something in the background that's working from inside. Um, I don't know that it can get into your email and stuff. Like that's where like your phone is constantly ask, asking you like, can this can so and so have access to this or your location or something like that's that's why they're doing that to reduce malware stuff. And we all do this for homework before Tuesday. All right, do all the do section three review, module review, and this before Tuesday. I'll check these on Tuesday, and then we'll study for a little bit and take the test. So have a good weekend. Please plug the laptops back in.